It used to be the case that when we would try to have machines do complicated tasks, we would try to articulate that task. You know, you want to do some sort of facial recognition. Oh, you're going to try to encode in there exactly how would one recognize an eyeball? How would one recognize like the shape of a face? Um, how do you detect loops and things like that? And then maybe there's a little bit of um, tweaking it based on data that it gets. Later on, especially as we had more and more computer processing, what we realized is, no, 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 don't try to articulate it perfectly. Just throw as much data as you can to the computer. Give it a halfway decent framework for converting data into something that it can extrapolate off of, right? And then work from that. Hello world, it's Siraj, and my guest on this episode is none other than 3Blue1Brown, aka Grant Sanderson. What the outstanding person does, others will try to do. The standards that such people create will be followed by the whole world. Grant is truly outstanding. He is the Picasso of math animation, the Da Vinci of math storytelling. He is truly in a league of his own. In just a few years, he's built a global following on YouTube of over 2 million subscribers based on his world-class math education videos. After studying math at Stanford, Grant started making videos and writing articles for Khan Academy as their multivariable calculus fellow. After that, he focused his full attention on his YouTube channel with lessons on topics like linear algebra, neural networks, calculus, Fourier transforms, the math of Bitcoin, and even quantum mechanics. Make no mistake, he's just getting started. And having said that, it's my honor to introduce the one, the only, three blue, one brown. Well, thanks for that truly absurd introduction that is <laughs> <laughs> orders of magnitude more complimentary than what I might deserve. But um, thanks for having me on. For sure, it, it's, it's an honor. Yeah, you are very humble. So uh, we've met once before, mm -hmm. yeah, and we like, knew each other by like indirectly because of Tomcat and... Yeah, we floated through similar circles. Like evidently you lived with some of my closest friends without me realizing that my brother knows you, I guess. Um, also just through YouTube yeah. related things. Like you, as you know, the education community on YouTube is pretty tight. Yeah, so. edutubers. Yep, yep. Up and coming edutubers. Exactly. Yeah. I know you know like Jabril's and... Mm -hmm. Oh boy, is Jabril's one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. <laughs> just unbridled delight with almost everything. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, Dan Schiffman as well and all good people. So um, I have a lot of questions for you, but I wanted to start off with something that kind of just happened. You were just in Bangalore. Yes, right? yes I was. Yes, tell me everything. Like how was it? What was your honest like initial reaction, your experience? It was your first time in India, right? It's true. On, I mean, I'll be honest. It was it was very short. It was honestly more of a layover than anything. Okay. I was um, giving the keynote address at a certain data science conference, uh, and then another one of the days I went to visit one of the universities while I was there. So I feel like it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say ah, I went to India. Right. Nevertheless, you know, tried to pack in what I could in that time. So the people are certainly very lovely and nice. Right, it's very well well received. Um, I think the traffic is uh, genuinely insane. I don't think I've ever experienced more micromorts than trying to be a pedestrian where I thought, oh, the best way to get to know a town is to walk through it. But boy, was that very different. Yeah. <laughs> Lane lines, you know, they're just suggestions more than rules. Um, so I wish I could tell you more in terms of having really delved into the culture and things like that. But through people that I know just in Silicon Valley who are like of Indian culture and such, I definitely think there's a certain value placed on um, certain types of education that, well, every culture values education. No one's going to say like, oh, no, we don't like that. There's a way that they do that seems a little bit distinct, I think. Um, and that, that's reflected in how deeply many people will go into technical fields, right, uh, and, and into math and things like that. So that I'm all behind. Awesome. Yeah. So you were there for like a day? Well, basically 48 hours Four of hours. actually being like not doing transit related things Damn. Uh, in India. It's so far. The flight is, oh my God. Yeah, but you can work on flights and right. I don't know. It was, it was one of those things of either I was going to allocate a little bit of time to go over or just not go at all. Yeah. And, you know, it's fun to just do different things. And I think when you're visiting any new place, the marginal value of each new day like rapidly declines after the first impressions, which isn't to say there's high depth to get from like spending meaningful time somewhere, but it does mean that in terms of bang for your buck, it's not like a totally insane thing to do um, if you're just there for a little. Totally. Especially if it's work related. If you're going for like, you know, with friends for tourism, then it's an insane thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say like, so I 
my parents are obviously from there, but like I was born in Houston, Texas. Oh, yeah? So when I went, I went for six months and I trained across the entire country. This oh, that's like great. Years ago. Um, and I remember thinking like there's, it's beautiful, but there's also so many like existential level problems here involving pollution and um, just like, I don't know, there's a lot of problems that I made me realize like we cannot solve these in our lifetimes. Hmm. We, we would, it made me depressed at first. And then I was just like, well, maybe if we create some kind of AI system that was like AGI related, it could solve it all for us and do the work of 10,000 scientists in a millisecond or something. And so I would say like that whole trip really is what makes me so devoted to constantly put, putting out these educational videos to hmm. try to make that happen. But yeah, it's interesting to hear your experience. Uh, but moving on. So <laughs> when preparing for this conversation, I was thinking about what could I do that would put me into Grant's shoes as much as possible. And obviously your videos are amazing and I watch them a lot, but what I don't do is try to use the tools that you're using. <laughs> good, good choice not good. to try. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, for those who don't know, it's kind of this hacked together tool where the channel started not as um, like I want to start a YouTube channel, but just a personal coding project. And anyone who has their own little personal library for whatever reasons, they know, you know, documentation isn't the biggest concern when it's just like your own use case kind of thing. Um, so it's like grown out because I've been making videos and made it open source because lots of people asked and like, why not? Um, more recently, people have started using it and like actually adding documentation and tutorials and things of that sort to make it a little less absurd to get started with. I'm curious though, what was your experience in trying to mess with it? So, um, so my production cycle is very different from yours in that I put, I'll put two videos a week mm -hmm. and you, you get some time and honestly, I'm a little envious that you, <laughs> you get to do that. But the algorithm has tuned itself to your output schedule as to not penalize you for taking some time or I don't even know who knows how the algorithm works. But I know that for me, if I skip two weeks, I'm going to get penalized in terms of new subscribers that are being sent to my channel. But so I, I'm sure there's a way I can do this where I could take more time and I wouldn't be penalized, but I'm just, I guess I'm afraid to. Well, there's different types of channels, right? I mean, uh, one of the benefits of regular production like that is you can have someone watching by habit. You know, there's a lot of things that I consume out of habit. Um, and then I'm glad that I do, you know, podcasts whose name might not be enticing, but the fact that I consumed it like every week, I'm exposed to a thing I wouldn't have thought to go to. And then there's the other strategy of um, really pouring yourself into one particular project where your hope is that people aren't consuming it by habit, but because something else surfaces it to them. People are sharing it. They thought to like check in on this channel even after like a while. So like wait, but why as a blog yeah. is the perfect example of just totally falls off the radar for a year yeah. and then comes back with something great. And like we as consumers, we kind of get, oh, like Tim has put a lot of heart into this. So we're willing to do that. Um, whereas if XKCD yeah. just like stopped putting out comics for a couple months, people would think, oh, I guess Randall Monroe died or something. And you just, you fall out of that habit. So neither one is necessarily better. Right. Um, and I think each, each cow is looking over at the other pasture and thinking it's a little bit greener on the other side because what you don't have, but I do, is a certain anxiety where I'm like, yeah, it's been four weeks since I've published something and you get antsy, right? Interesting. Yeah, no, I definitely do get anxiety, much less though, just in general, like in life. It's caused me to start meditating a lot more hmm. to, to help reduce that as a tool, as a technology. Um, but yeah, to answer your question about my experience with... Sorry, got distracted. No, no, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> yeah there's a lot your to talk Your experience with my shitty tool. No, yeah. It's, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? You're, you're allowed that? to say whatever you want. Great. There, there, there are no owners here. I have no owners. So... Help me pronounce it. Is it Manim? Manim, yeah. Manim, cool. Mathematical animations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes total sense as a name. So, uh, you know, I'm always doing Python for my videos. So this, I felt like I had some kind of, um, yeah, it wouldn't be that hard. So um, the reason I said I have a one-week production cycle is because I incorporated some Manim into this video for the first time. Hmm. It's going to come out on Monday. What I found was getting it set up, easy. Um, running that ba like basic latex, easy. Even getting like, like in your old projects folder, like those continual animation is deprecated, mm -hmm. but it's like, well, what do I use instead? And I saw that there was a comment, but I was like, oh yeah, man, I should add some documentation. There, there's a much better way of doing what that was doing. Yeah. It's like what previously you had to create a new class for and things like that is just like a single line of something more functional. Yeah. I can show you after the podcast and then probably should go in and add documentation because uh, yeah, for, for anything where you want um, a constant updating on every frame, right? As opposed to saying, I want 
this thing to happen over this set of time, right? Like that's a very common use case. So uh, the reason I know this is like hyper specific details, maybe no, <laughs> relevant to like those listening to the we're podcast. We're all technical. But yeah, it's one of those things where um, it was a clunky way of doing things, and there evolved two different ways of doing things. And just as a matter of principle, it's like there shouldn't be two ways of doing things, right? One could say you should also have the principle of documenting things when you <laughs> shift to that one. Um, I can show you, but there. Yeah, yeah, I'd love that. And I was just thinking, like, like I totally get how, not totally, I get basically high level how you can make, create these objects, like visual, like visual objects. What I don't understand is how you transition them. Like, how do you morph the neural network's nodes into the equation? Like, is there one function for that or are they all custom functions? There's one function. There's right? one function. So um, it, the, the name, there's, so the, the architecture here is you've got like scenes, right? And that's something that, um, uh, it's like a scene of a video. It might last for 30 seconds or something like that. A scene is composed of animations, which are the specific movements happening during it. And then you've got the like objects or mathematical objects abbreviated awkwardly to mobjects in the code yeah. that uh, you're like manipulating. So one of the most common forms of a animation is this transform thing where you transform one object into another. So you give it the part of the neural network that corresponds to some variable or however you've named that. And you say, I want this to transform into this piece of LaTeX that is, um, this is how I want to visually communicate things. So then there's like sort of a simple, but also it got a little bit hairy algorithm in there for like whatever two objects you enter, it'll transform one of them into another, right? Beautiful. And, you know, it's aesthetically pleasing to watch things transform like that. And that's probably the key aesthetic of the whole channel is this idea of communicating connections between objects with like a connection over time that one thing turns into the other or they like wiggle at the same time or something like that. I think that's one of the powers of video and animation as a medium. Whereas otherwise, if you're doing it in text, you have to say, you have to label it and say, this is like equation number one and it corresponds to this part of the diagram. And the viewer has to do that in their mind or the reader has to do that in their mind to say, oh, these two things are related. So um, yeah, th there's one, basically one very general function that handles all that. And then a lot of things are subclasses of transform to do more specific kinds. You know, if you want it to happen in a certain way or, um, you know, a, a common use case here is let's say you, you just want something to move to a different location or you want to like apply a method to it in some way. What you're effectively doing is like you want to create a copy of that object, apply the method to it, and then have the original turn into the latter. You know, so there's just more compact code to make that kind of thing happen. Um, so you don't have to actually create the copy of the object, actually apply it, and then like call this transform thing. But as far as substantive like algorithmic activity going on, it's all rooted in that one. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, it's good to know. I yeah. So I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about like whether or not to bring this up with you because I don't want to take any of your time away from what you're doing. It is like, you know, it is God's work. <laughs> it is like <laughs> what you are doing is so impact. I don't even think as a creator, you can fully understand how impactful it is. Like, for example, I was like one time at a bar in Slovenia and I met some math professor at University of Slovenia. The first thing he started talking to me about is three blue one. <laughs> That's like, funny. That was, it was crazy. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I know Grant. And, and then he, he was like, wide eyed. And I was like, this isn't Slovenia. So anyway, just imagine like all the countries. Anyway, so what I was thinking it was, you know, when I first started the channel, I was doing it mostly not out of ego, mostly because I, w I felt like this, this needed to happen. Like people needed this education. No one was making it weird in this way and accessible to the people outside of like this kind of like rigid community of like intellectuals. And when I saw other people kind of imitating or emulating or copying my work, there was a little bit of like a pang of like, I want that glory. Mm. But over time that went away and I started like realizing like this is what needs to happen. If I as an individual want to have the most impact, then I need to teach other teachers how to teach like yes. me, right? Yeah. Which you, I'm sure you've already come to that conclusion as well. So the reason I say that is School of AI, like my initiative is like me helping teach these other representatives in other cities, all volunteers, how to teach AI in their own languages. So when it comes to the, in, into the context of Manim, I wonder if your time, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe some portion of your time could be used to create some kind of playlist or series on how to use Manim so that the other educators of the world have this tool to empower themselves, you know, to visualize concepts that they find interesting because you are one person. Yeah. 
No, I, I think that's wholly worthwhile. I, um, I'll say the main qualm I have is I feel like there's aspects of the workflow with it that are worse than they need to be right now. For example, it's, it's just slower to render than it needs to be. Um, and it would be much nicer if you have a quickly interactive live updating experience with the objects that you're coding, which is totally possible. And it's just a matter of putting in the time to make that happen. Because um, once it looks like that, then I would feel much more comfortable saying, OK, now I'll bring people on, actively encourage them to use it. And in that encouragement, I can know that their experience isn't going to be too terrible. Whereas right now, I feel like those who find it, you know, they have to they'll see it on the FAQ and the website. They like dig into the readme. They're the kind of people that dig in. And they sort of understand, OK, this wasn't advertised to me. I'm digging in. I'm like, I'm in for it. And they'll be a little bit more tolerant of, let's say, a suboptimal experience, right? Whereas as soon as you're doing something that actively encourages people to use this particular tool, I will always actively encourage people to create math videos and whatever their favorite way to do it is. But if I'm encouraging them on this specific tool, it had better be a, like, a decent user experience. And I see specific things that can be done between now and when it is a good experience that, in my mind, are a little bit of a bottleneck between... Um, let's say, like putting out a video that is like the tutorial on Manum. Second thing, there actually does exist like a 10 to 12 video tutorial sequence on Manum that someone else created yeah. um, that is out there. Uh, and then also blog posts to that effect too. So even, even in light of my own degeneracy and slowness on making this happen, th that has come into existence. Um, but I do think the first step really is making sure that it is a good experience, especially for people who maybe aren't super savvy digging into new things, right? The prototypical example might be a math teacher who knows some code. They're not the kind who are like actively engaging with weird open source projects out there anyway. They know a little bit, and they're willing to put in some elbow grease to squeak something out. I want to make sure that that is the use case, um, that they can create the thing that they want to. Um, and the interim, there's lots of great tools out there. Mathematica? Freaking awesome for creating math visuals, Desmos, GeoGebra, right? All of these things that for many use cases are going to hit exactly the nail that you want to hit, especially if you're teaching something graphical. Um, the main benefit of the tooling that I use is when I want to create like a fundamentally different type of object and then let that object interact with a completely different type. You know, I want to talk about vector fields and flow, right? So it's not going to be a graph that I pull up in Desmos. Instead, I'm going to have something that illustrates that fluid flow in some way. And then I want to put other objects in there and have it flow according to the vector field. Maybe in the spirit of communicating something like differential equations or like divergence and curl or something like that. And then another day, maybe I'm talking about neural networks. So I want to create the new object that corresponds to that. It would make no sense for a Desmos or GeoGebra type character to implement this one-off you know, neural networks visual type thing. But for me, producing one video or like a small sequence of videos, it actually makes sense to create that ad hoc case. So um, it depends on the use case someone has in mind. Definitely. Yeah. And I can see how like, and there's so many variants of neural nets as well. Yes. So like having mm -hmm. a module could, could be helpful for that. So um, yeah, masterclass, if you're listening, like you should pay Grant like a million bucks to teach a class on Manum or something at some point. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so cool. So your process has evolved over mm -hmm. the years. You've been doing this for, I think, four, year now, four years now? I guess that's right. Um, I consider like start of 2017 is when I started doing it seriously, but first upload was 2015, so you're right. 2015, yeah, so about four years now. I'm, I'm sure your process has evolved through many iterations. We were talking before how I think at one point you had new hires who were helping you, and then you I think you scrapped that. I did roll back. You rolled um, back. Yeah. I can relate to that. I, yeah. I do the same. It's like grow and like decline in terms of the number of contractors working with me. Mm -hmm. What does your process look like now? I know as a creator that there is a finish. There's a finish, but there's not really necessarily a start. Yeah. Right? The finish is when you hit publish. <laughs> but the start is, is it when you're reading math papers? Is it when... Great question. Yeah, right. I feel like the best way to do that, you don't want it to be the case that you start a project and it's at that point that you begin learning about the thing. What's much more effective is if you had had some familiarity with that thing for at least a year that you'd been mulling over in your mind. So I try to very actively continue learning new things, especially just in pure math, because that's the thing that I love. And then I have a running list of content. And you know, as I move on to the next project, I'll choose something, which presumably I've done some ambient research about 
just in terms of that free time spend. But once I say this is the next project, then there's a little bit more of a dedicated reading the things that I need to, uh, trying out different like trajectories of what the storyline for teaching it might look like. When I'm on top of my game, maybe I do sample lessons with friends. When I'm not, I just imagine what that would look like, right? And the writing process actually takes me a meaningfully long time. I think a lot of people think that most of the time goes into the animations, but quite often I'll just be going back and forth on what a script will be for two weeks, right? Which feels inefficient because there's other times when you write a script in an afternoon and you think this feels great, let's go. So I wish there was a way to speed that up, but I think, I just think that's one of those fundamental limitations um, on the writing side. Then it becomes happy and deterministic because once you're putting visuals to it, you know that each hour of work corresponds to a basically deterministic amount of progress, right? And maybe that looks like beginning to create the infrastructure for that type of content. You know, if it's visual types that I hadn't dealt with before, creating the playground so that you can manipulate it nicely. Um, but much of it is sort of going sentence by sentence and saying, what will the visual for this be? What will the visual for this be? And then once all of those are in place, editing all together, which, you know, takes maybe a day, if that. And you, you do it all yourself? Yeah, yeah, I do. So I, I, I'm pretty adamant about the idea that the creation of the visuals and the writing should not be separate processes. Because quite often, while I'm doing the visuals, I'll realize based on how it looks, oh, I actually want to restructure the script, or I want to rephrase some of this paragraph. And I think that back and forth is very healthy. When you separate those across different minds, it means the layer of communication isn't a corpus callosum. Instead, it's like active communication or Slack or email or something like that that's inevitably going to like halt the process or more realistically, it's going to result in a, a feeling of mm, less connection between the words spoken and then the visuals that you see on screen. And I think you see this with a lot of uh, channels that are, um, and it's not, this isn't a bad thing, but those that have a production team and an assembly line, we've got this person is the artist, this person is the animator, this person is the writer. They produce a lot of content and it often is quite good, but it doesn't quite have that passion project, tight sinking feel that I'm kind of going for. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. I, I mean, I do have an editor and an animator. Um, I, I'm like you in that most of my time is spent with the script, right? Right. Shooting is just like a, for me, like, cause I have a visual, like me element waving my hands around. That's a, just like, you know, an hour, but most of it, most of the joy really I find is in technical writing. Hmm. I've always considered myself above all else a technical writer, which is like a field that not many people even recognize exists. Um, you're obviously a technical writer. Wait, but why is like kind of a technical writer? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really interesting that it's all you. Yeah, I mean. I don't, necess I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. That might be just my own personality of not being great to work with, right? Especially if it's live footage type stuff, I think having an editor makes a bunch of sense because often you're dealing with many hours of footage that you just need to trim down to something reasonable. So I don't, I'm not saying like this is what I would suggest for people running channels. It's more a statement about me than about what is optimal. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Like I've like cycled through many editors and I also have a hard time working with other people. I think that's just a part of the thing about being a creative yeah. is that you have a very distinct vision of what this should look like. Um, but I have found that this practice of like constantly writing down, like, you know, I'll write my script and then I'll write down what the animation should look like. Mm. And the editor does that. So now because it's become this cycle, if for example, I have another editor in the future, I know how to communicate that because that's a learned process. So I wonder like if there could be a man and wizard editor for grants <laughs> that you like take on and train. Yeah. And at one point you can just focus on writing alone unless you enjoy making these visuals. That's the best part. I would go crazy if I didn't have the like creating visuals part of the video production. Wow. If I was nothing but a writer, boy, that would just, I would just go crazy. Yeah. Right? Don't do that. Then yeah, stick to what you, okay. Wow. It's the writing feels like a great inhale and the animating feels like a great exhale, you know? Wow. Well said. Yeah. I like that metaphor. I got to remember that one. Um, that might be the met the quote of the, of the podcast. So, um, what so Manum is one tool you use. What what other tools do you use for, or is that the only one for visualization? I mean, so you know, you want to do as much in an actual video editor as is reasonable, right? Um, I happen to use Final Cut Pro. Uh, Same. I know, you know, maybe the Adobe Creative Suite is the thing that more more real creators That's do. That's what they say. But I just I just don't like Adobe. Me neither. <laughs> so I, I get Final Cut. Don't don't make me switch. Yeah. Um, as it is, I'm like I'll use Illustrator for uh, creating vectorized images sometimes. 
And whenever I do, I'm like, why am I not just using Figma for this? Um, and uh, I use Audacity for the narration. Uh, some, oh, uh, here, and here's a real tool that I'll use, Grapher. Um, it's built into OS X. Not a lot of people know that it exists. It's, yeah. one of, it's like a secret island that you would only know it's there if you think to search for it. Absolutely phenomenal tool. Like one of the greatest graphing programs that exists. And you can create pretty much any 3D math thing that you'll want because it's um, uh, very robust in that way. So often with uh, 3D visuals, if it's especially if it's something graphical or easily parameterized, super quick to just put it together in Grapher. You can even animate stuff if you parameterize it in the right way. As soon as it gets a little too complicated, because there's no notion of layers of abstraction like there is with programming, then you start. It gets a little bit hairy, and you realize, ah, I would have rather done this uh, in Python. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend that to anyone who happens to be on OS X. Nice. I gotta remember those. Cool. Yeah. So. Um, when you're reading math papers, I assume it's math papers that you're mostly reading, or is it just a combination of blog posts whenever you're researching math or learning? Yeah, like or books. Or um, books. Because it quite often I'm not, I'm not teaching what's at the forefront of human knowledge, right? Um, you know, if I'm making a video about the Fourier transform, I'm not talking about like the latest updates in the generalizations of Fourier transforms relevant to representation theory or something. It's like, no, we're sort of going with a... A plain vanilla, but you still want to have a sense of, you know, how is it that electrical engineers think about this versus how is it that pure mathematicians think about this? Um, so like textbooks or blog posts or things like that. Makes sense. Yeah. Same. Or like for me, it's also like Reddit, Twitter, mm. you know, these subreddits and uh, the associate. Do you know distill? Distill. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're beautiful. So they're wonderful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. Interaction. Anything Chris Ola creates is just top notch. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Him and uh, Andre Carpathy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. So um, so I read math papers a certain way. I, will, I was curious how you read math. How, like, how do you read math? Right. So you go in knowing that you're going to start off very confused. No matter how much math you know, um, unless you're an active researcher in that field, you're going to be kind of confused by the paper, right? Uh, and I think part of this is because the natural structure that math has evolved is to start with your definitions right? And then to give your theorems and then to prove those theorems, maybe have an example later on. When it's a good author, they start with like a motivating example. Um, I've only very recently acquired the, uh, the Princeton Companion to Mathematics, which is essentially just like a whole pile of articles about modern math and such. And I don't know why I haven't owned this for like a decade because each one is written actually quite well, where almost everything, even though it's deeply technical, is introduced with motivating examples and things like that. So as much as possible, you want to reverse engineer what a well-written paper would feel like. So you maybe get a loose feel for what it's going to be about with the abstract and such, but you just jump to the examples or something like that, right? Um, or as soon as there's any indication of motivation, you try to see what that is. And then you look back at the definitions and you kind of mull that over in your mind a little bit. Um, and then there's usually going to be some like key, not necessarily insight, but the point of a non-trivial contribution, right? Like, what is it that makes, I don't know, why, why is the Fourier transform or something like that actually um, a meaningful mathematical tool, right? And you try to drill on, okay, wh where is that? What, what exactly is the non-trivial thing that happens? And then that's the thing you let yourself sort of meditate on. Um, but honestly, it's one of those things where it's hard to say something very general because it depends author by author, book by book, paper by paper. Um, but I'm, I'm very adamant on you will learn through inundating yourself with examples rather than inundating yourself with definitions. There's a parallel with machine learning here, right? It used to be the case that when we would try to have machines do complicated tasks, we would try to articulate that task. You know, you want to do some sort of facial recognition. Oh, you're going to try to encode in there exactly how would one recognize an eyeball? How would one recognize like the shape of a face? Um, how do you detect loops and things like that? And then maybe there's a little bit of um, tweaking it based on data that it gets. Later on, especially as we had more and more computer processing, what we realized is, no, 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 no. Don't try to articulate it perfectly. Just throw as much data as you can to the computer. Give it a halfway decent framework for converting data into something that it can extrapolate off of, right? And then work from that. Same deal with human learning. Definitions are the equivalent of trying to hand code a complicated task, right? Whereas just inundating yourself with examples, it's like, we've got the neural network up here, right? Just machine learn your way into it. Yeah. And that's actually going to be way more effective. Absolutely, yeah, and, and that, I feel like it's it's so counterintuitive to how people think programs work. So that's right, it, right. <laughs> it's because it's all, like the very word program insinuates a certain deliberate 
like anticipated designed uh what's the word i'm looking for it's just a designed way of doing things but machine learning is almost not designed right it's it's emergent totally yeah it's emergent it's emergent in the way that sometimes some forms of music can be created in an emergent fashion I know that you are a fan of the Punch Brothers. That's true. Yeah, I'm also a fan. I, I saw them at Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. Did you ever go to that festival? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's where I, that's where I first saw them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they're super good. And you're also a mandolin player. Right? A little bit. Yeah, I started by learning violin, and then in college, I'm like too shy to practice my violin in a dorm room. But mandolins, you can make quieter, and it's the same tuning. So you feel like, oh wow, I just already know how to play this instrument a little bit. Yeah. Right? So love the mandolin. That's super cool. I wonder, like, have you ever considered? Um, cause I do this. Do you, have you ever considered add, adding like a musical element to your videos of like, I don't know, you playing the mail in and then uh, some kind of visualization happening. The short answer is yes, but I won't go into details. Okay. We'll just, we'll just see, we'll see if this actually unfolds by the end of the year, but that's actually not as absurd a question as you might think. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's exciting. So, um, speaking about, uh, machine learning, and speaking about the superset of machine learning data science, I know that um, at some point you had an interest in data science, and that's not to say that you don't now, but you were particularly interested in it, I think, while you were a student at Stanford, mm -hmm. and you considered going down a data science path. What do you think about the field these these days? Like, does data science interest you as much as hard math? Or Well, so at that time, it was basically like I had the, a certain internship um, and it was one of these, like, maybe instead of going back to school, just continue at the company kind of things. And that's where I was considering it heavily. In truth, most of my time was less on statistical analysis and more on, you know, creating the data pipelines and the infrastructure for that. So it's really more software engineering than statistics, which my loose impression is that's actually, if you track the hours spent of, like, data scientists, kind of a lot of it, right? It's more infrastructural or getting this piece of software to talk to this piece of software. Um, so in f so far as there is statistical analysis on top of that, awesome. Who doesn't love that? I think I just realized for me personally, what I was really looking for was a place that I could be using math in industry. And it was always like math is this primary driver, which is a little selfish, right? I think the maybe like more moral way to think about things is what is your impact on the world? And quite often that does happen through industry, right? It's sort of this forcing function of do people find it valuable? Whereas you don't want to end up in an ivory tower just answering questions about not theory because you thought to ask them, but like no one finds value in it. So I did the selfish thing and was like, nah, I want to figure out ways to make pure math a deeper part of what I do, right? I'm pretty unplugged from what modern data science looks like as a result, right? I think, um, I think if you were to throw me in like an interviewing room for any decent company and like ask if I could answer the questions to apply to be a data scientist, you know, without a couple months of brushing up on what's going on, I would just fail that interview every time these days. So yeah, I'm unplugged. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it makes sense. You, you, we're still humans. We can't have super domain knowledge about everything all at, all at the same time. But speaking about um, going back to college and then going back to this decision that you made about pursuing hard math as a like as a storyteller, your dad was, correct me if I'm wrong, a mathematician? Nope, nope. No. He, uh, he was a pilot. A pilot who was really into math. Uh, he, I think his, so he definitely taught me math when I was younger. And he was one of these dads that was very, you know, he wanted his kids to both be curious. And I think he also just loves knowledge. So you know how dads often try to vicariously live through their kids yeah. where ostensibly they're teaching the kids something, but really they just want to engage with the thing themselves. Um, so he would play these games with us and sorts. But I think his own education, if I, unless I'm wrong, he was, an, did he study aeronautical engineering? He studied some kind of engineering. And I think his math education probably stopped at about calculus. Um, so he wasn't a mathematician, but is very smart. You know, I yeah. have a lot of respect for him. Um, and uh, certainly was the one to ignite curiosity in me, like, at a very young age. Yeah. So I can see that. I can see how that that influence could have helped you get into the hard maths more. Your mom was an immigrant from Ireland. That's true. Boy, yeah. you did your homework. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and she was more interested in security for you over like a less traditional path like YouTube. Oh, this is funny. Where did you learn these things? <laughs> the internet, the interwebs, <laughs> the interwebs. So, so um, you chose to, I don't want to say defy, but go take your own path 
I, I will say I've always had extremely supportive parents. I've okay. never had I've never had any like strong pushback from let's say my mom uh, saying like oh like why are you creating videos like this seems like a weird thing. Instead, it would be if ever there was a choice and I'm seeking advice like hey should I do such and such which you know will be lucrative or do, should I do such and such which is a little weirder and riskier. You know I think most moms would you know err on the side of well, let's do the thing that has a little bit more assurance to it. Um, but I never got any sense of, boy, am I really putting my relationship with my family at stake by leaving college without a concrete plan other than is there a nice way to explain math on the internet and stuff like that, right? Um, or when I was like leaving Khan Academy to do the YouTube thing, um, I think th there, w there was never any uh, like, oh, we think this is a fundamentally irresponsible thing to do. And uh, if anything, there was just like abundant love and encouragement, which I feel very fortunate for because I know a lot of people don't have that. Yeah, no, it's interesting because when I was thinking about that, I was thinking like, well, maybe he like defied it because like because I can relate to that just because like immigrant parents are like the opposite <laughs> of like well, yeah, no, like I mean, totally do the safest thing because yeah. that's all we're here for. In but. some ways, we're like the ingrates who don't know how good we have it by virtue of like growing up in America or having like opportunity in certain ways, right? Yes. So, the the immigrant mentality is the rational one of for God's sake hold on to what you have because yeah. you don't know when it's going to evaporate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I admire that about you that you just you decided to do that. And it wasn't even for like the, the the initial motivation behind the channel. It correct me if I'm wrong. It wasn't even for like other people as it much as it was for yourself, and that's what you wanted to do the most. Is is that right? <sighs> it's very hard to answer these things honestly, right? Yeah, because I mean. One of the biggest delights comes from when people say thank you in one way or another, and you realize, man, like some someone's finding value in this. At the same time, like of course, there's a selfish component on making content that I just delight in. I'm sure you have this too. Yeah. Right? yeah. So the honest answer is it's going to be some mixture of you feel yes, this seems like it's valuable for the world. I get feedback to that effect, but I also just delight in math and kind of want to swim in that own delight. So I don't know what the original motivation was as much like how that tipped on the scales between selfless desire to teach the world versus selfish desire to spend as much of my own time thinking about different perspectives of math. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I honestly can't introspect without probably lying about it in some way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, but it's cool that you explore, like you explore different ideas, you, you, you go down different paths. And one thing I also admire about you is the fact that sometimes you'll spend time on a script for maybe like two or three weeks and then scrap it. Ah, yes. It's, yeah. I, I think a lot of people luxury. don't like that this happens. <laughs> well, I don't have the luxury of doing that. Like if I'm, well, depend, like the way my production cycle sure, is, yeah. I, I can do whatever I want, obviously, but like the way my production cycle is, I just gotta, gotta go all in. So based on that and the fact that you have done that, has it ever been the case that you scrapped a project or video because it was too complex? Yeah, probably. And, and if so, uh, how, like, what is one like concept that was too complex for you? Well, I think one. So I made this video about the Riemann zeta function, um, and then I mentioned that it's a great the, video. Uh, like the reason mathematicians care about this thing is because it encodes the distribution of primes. Um, we, uh, you know, primes feel like this very random process, uh, like how can you know what the next number is going to be? We actually have an exact formula to tell you how many primes there are up to a number x, which looks kind of like a step function, but a very chaotic random step function. We don't just have approximations. We have an exact formula for that. The catch is that it's written in terms of another hard to understand set of numbers. They happen to be complex numbers, but that's not necessarily relevant. So. I made some sort of vague promise to the effect of, oh, and I might like explain what this has to do with prime numbers, what that relation is. Um, probably the truth about why I didn't at that time is I don't think I understood the relation well enough. I probably understood at the level of you can follow the proof, but uh, complex analysis, which is the relevant field surrounding that, has a lot of theorems which run the risk of feeling a little bit like a black box. You know, you say you do you perform some integral of some complicated function and in the realm of complex numbers you're not just integrating along the real number line from you know zero to t you're integrating along paths um, which might feel like a complicated thing but things simplify greatly where if you go around a closed loop you effectively only count the number of zeros and poles of a function or something like that 
And I just felt like, okay, actually explaining this in a way where you're not appealing to something that just is a total black box, I, d I didn't necessarily find a nice way to do that. And I think it stemmed from not understanding the material at a deep enough level. Um, I sort of bring up this example because it's been something I've been thinking about more and more in the last couple of weeks. And I think, I think it's probably more reasonable now to bring that closer to the top of the topic list at some point. But yeah, like complex material is hard. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> you no, know? Totally. Because um, there's, there's different styles. I kind of don't want to cut corners, I guess, where I think what some people will find appealing about the channel, and maybe this goes for yours as well, right, is you feel that uh, if you watch something, you know, it's not a given that you'll understand everything, but it's all there to be understood. There's not any, and you just have to take my word for this, let's skip. Sometimes that happens, but I, I try to minimize that as much as possible. It's like, this is the actual sequence of steps of intuition that will get you there. Um, and some pieces of math, it's like that sequence of steps, if you're going to really unpack what's going on, is extremely long, <laughs> right? Uh, and maybe that makes it beyond the scope of a 30-minute video. Yes, and I feel like in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence more broadly, the field kind of brings into itself people who have this deep interest into the nature of reality mm. and consciousness. Like it kind of attracts these curious people, which I am one of. So one of the topics for me that I thought was would be too hard for me to make a video on is the nature of consciousness because no one really knows what it is. So on that note, what are your thoughts? And they're all theories, nobody knows. What are your thoughts on what consciousness is do you and this relates to spirituality a slash religion well let me ask you, what do you mean by the word consciousness yeah so consciousness as in the the being that we are like who are you like the identity of an entity that is alive so would you consider like a fire to have consciousness no because it isn't alive I know you're going to say, like, what is alive? I, I, w I won't be that You'll jerk be that, that like, <laughs> continues asking down. But yeah, sure, sort of. uh, like bacteria? Yes, bacteria is conscious. Virus? Yes. But not fire. But not fire because... It metabolizes, it replicates. But it's not making decisions. Is a virus? Yeah, to replicate. It's making predictions, let's say that. I think a fire is too. It's like, I predict that that piece of wood will be dry enough for me to burn it. So I'm going to go over there. But it's not making them conscious. I, I guess we're going. I don't think a virus. I think the level of decision making a virus makes is exactly the same as a fire. It's not saying, oh, that looks like a juicy piece of DNA. Let me go. It's just like molecules bouncing around. And sometimes those molecules bounce into ones that uh, start a certain transcription process on its little scrap of DNA that feels as... Um, emergent and unintentional as a fire spreading from one tree to another. This is not your original no, no, question no, no, on consciousness. No, it's, it's, it's profound. It's, 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 yeah, this is good. This is good. I, I like being like questioned in this way, I guess. Yeah. Well, it, so I'll say like on the topic of consciousness, it's unclear to me that everyone's talking about the same thing. That's kind of why I asked, cause you have like the very famous Thomas Nagel notion of what is it like to be a bat? Right. And that's not really a definition so much as it uh, is, an exemplifying uh, thought experiment. You know, you say, what would it be like to be a bat? And you know that, hmm, okay, so my experience is gonna be different because of like the sonar, or the ability to fly. And the very fact that you're able to play this thought experiment of asking what is it like to be the thing is what it means for the thing to have consciousness. Unclear to me if that's like well-defined <laughs> or, or if that's just playing off of our ability to mirror ourselves into other situations independent of the reality of those situations. Others seem to use the word consciousness to refer to an awareness of oneself. Like our minds have this model of the world around us. I have some sort of model of this cup or a model of you, and I'm constantly making predictions about what those things will do next. I don't know this cup in and of itself. I don't know you in and of yourself. Instead, it's all based on some sort of model in my mind that hopefully corresponds to like the reality. This is sort of like the Kantian noumena versus phenomena idea. And the idea of consciousness is that I myself am one of the things that's modeled, that I am like the universe perceiving itself, right? Which feels like a distinct notion because, you know, you can have a computer who models itself in some way, right? Any robot in the world might have some sense of what is the space being occupied it in terms of in the X dimension and in the Y dimension and what does that imply about when it's going to hit a wall? 
So that sort of self-reference, we don't seem to feel like we should call that consciousness, right? Um, but the Thomas Nagel notion, it's unclear if that's even well-defined or what that means, because I could say, I think it is something, there is something that it is like to be a drone. And you might say, I don't think so. I think it's purely an automaton. And then the conversation just sort of stops. So where I get confused about it is, and this is, this is very much like the mathematician's instinct on, okay, what are the definitions <laughs> at yes. play, right? And the fact that there's not clarity on that, like, oh, I'm, at least for me, I haven't, I haven't felt like, oh, here's a clear definition that everyone agrees upon for consciousness, which is in some part the challenge. From the mathematician's perspective, you say, I'm sorry, we can't have a meaningful discussion about it until there's a definition. Then we can start talking about fundamental truths. I so. think that that is the best mentality to have. And, and I agree with that. Like that is what I strive to, to, that's the frame that I strive to have. Do you know a guy named Eric Weinstein? I know of him. Uh, I might even follow him on Twitter, but I, I'm not going to be well versed in his work. Nice. Well, anyway, he's like the managing director of Teal Capital, like Peter Teal's firm, and he's a mathematician. And like, he got me really into physics just by talking about it on Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm. So I started learning a lot about class. So I, I bought Feynman's lectures, which now I'm in love with Feynman. Oh boy. I could, I could rant for an entire podcast on why I love Feynman. <laughs> I saw your video on Feynman. It was great. Oh, yeah. I hope that I make 20 more about Feynman because that man is just my like intellectual hero. He is amazing for sure. Do you know, like he went to like strip clubs to like do math sometimes this, i mean so he had this whole reputation right of being this like <laughs> quirky mildly philanderous womanizing character who would just go and like write his equations on cocktail napkins and things like that i'm all but like what's funny is his persona isn't so i know i'm ranting so no, I'll, I'll let you please, continue please, with please. your eric no, 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 story. it feels like his persona was very carefully constructed by himself from his like autobiography you know surely you're joking and he has certainly well well tailored stories about the version of himself that he wants to put out there as this character contrary to most physicists. What's equally interesting is the slightly more honest story about him, especially if we think about, let's say, like his um, relationship with relationships and love and things of that sort, right? Not a lot of people know that he was married uh, quite young, deeply in love with uh, this young girl who he knew since he was in high school. During the Manhattan Project, she got very sick, uh, tragically ended up dying. So he was going in between running his small com computation group at the Manhattan Project and visiting her in the hospital, regularly writing notes to each other. They were being playful and encoding it in such ways that the security guards who would read all mail coming in and out uh, wouldn't be able to know what they were saying to each other and things like that. Um, and what's abundantly clear is like, he was a very deep soul. Years after she died, there's this letter that he wrote directly to her that's just heartbreaking, right? And you don't really think of Feynman as this character because you're like, ah, oh, no, he's off doing equations and strip clubs and things like that. So the <laughs> idea of him like writing this heartfelt note to a wife that he knows doesn't exist but is talking to her as if she does, like, man, this is, okay, there's, there's more depth to this person than you realize. I think the same goes for his relationship with physics and math, where we often, we see kind of the simplified version where he wants to really get down to the substance of it that doesn't involve jargon. He just hates jargon and like pushes it all out entirely um, to the point where what's most appealing about his explanations, say in the Feynman lectures, is kind of the elementarity of it all, right? It feels, which is good, and that's a positive. Almost to the point where it obfuscates the fact that he was an extremely deep thinker who was like w obviously well on the forefront for his Nobel Prize work and things like that. Um, but somehow like people have this impression. I remember I was reading a book with Feynman on the title in like a cafe or something like that. And this woman struck up a conversation talking about him. She's like, you know, what's interesting is he never really liked math that much. I'm like, that is absolutely incorrect. He was deeply into math since a very young age, right? But I think as part of his wanting to be contrary for most physicists, you know, this like philandering character, another part of that was a disdain for what mathematicians do. Um, I don't know. There's many layers to him. And I think... I'm sorry. So no, no, Feynman lectures, sorry. Eric Weinstein inspired you into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've been learning about physics. I've learned about physics. And um, what I've learned um, in like two sentences is that classical mechanics works really well. Uh, it's, it's why we have airplanes and, you know, transistors and stuff. And quantum mechanics works really well at the mic, like the atomic level, but they don't fit together. Like we can't solve gravity. Like, right. This is what uh, Leonard Susskind is all about, like trying to find a theory of gravity. I would say classical and quantum fit together quite well. But what's hard is 
fitting together like uh, gen this is my understanding. I also please, don't know anything. Please, yeah. Fitting together like general relativity with quantum field theory kind of notions. But one of the great successes of quantum mechanics is how well it describes classical mechanics. Yes, but like from the quantum level, we can't derive gravity like going all the way up, can we? Like that's no, not to, yeah, not gravity. Like quantum gravity is like the hottest question in physics in 2019. If if I'm not if I'm correct, that's my understanding too. Yeah. So so because of that, it makes me think like if it, if that is the case, could it be the case that um, the field equations, that um, the space-time continuum as we know it, all of the equations related to that are actually approximations of what the real equations are, which are totally based on quantum mechanics. And if that is the case, then might that have something to do with the nature of consciousness in that we have an individual consciousness that is totally local, but in the still mind, in the depths of meditation, we can connect to a universal consciousness that exists, that exists outside of our physical body. And that there is some way to mathematically describe this using quantum mechanics. This is the thing I've been so, most afraid to say, and if this is the first time I'm saying it on my channel, so <laughs> people are gonna come at me for this, but what do you think of that crazy idea? Oh, uh, well, I mean, you, you might be able to guess, I guess. I think that's it's very um, natural to end up in a phase of kind of fuzzy thinking with respect to the relationship that like quantum mechanics has to the mind because often we think oh quantum mechanics it feels like it's describing unintuitive things and it's also you know it's, it's hard to think about like not a lot of us know much about like um, complex vector spaces so the very language that we use to describe it it just feels weird and then we have this other thing like consciousness that also feels weird and i think that there's like we as pattern matching machines really want the different weird things that we see to be like connected in some way. But it might be the case that the challenge of consciousness or understanding it, well, that's just wholly separate. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I'll give you an example. It's like very similarly, people will often draw relations between free will and the non-determinism of quantum mechanics, right? Where it feels like one of the initial quandaries with free will is that the universe with laws of physics feels very deterministic. Um, this is Laplace's notion where if you know the positions and momenta of every single particle, in principle, you know the future as well, where you can compute it with a great enough mind. Um, and that feels at odds with our sense that we can make decisions and that the future is not determined because, for God's sake, I have a choice. So that's this, this conflict, this hard thing that's hard to think about. And then separately, you have quantum mechanics um, displaying non-deterministic phenomena. And I think a lot of people leap onto, aha, therefore, it's the non-determinism of quantum that leads to choice. But you back up, that makes no sense, right? If you, were, if you were a puppet, right, and you knew that there was a puppet master who was determining what you did, however, he was rolling dice every time that he was making a decision what you were going to do, and it was fundamentally random, the choices that he was making, you wouldn't feel like you had any more of a free will, right? So I think the question of randomness is wholly orthogonal to the question of free will, but we love to leap on that. Similarly, I think the question of, like, the relationship that quantum field theory has to gravity um, and the fact that you have a certain... You know, you've got permeating fields and things like that, and the sense while you're meditating of something that's like outside of yourself. There's a temptation to draw connections there, where, unless there's good reason to, I, I, personally, am not going to be the kind who like buys that at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I also don't want to. I'm not. I don't want to be one of those jerks. that's like that's a dumb idea. No, so no, it's, and then like it's sh just, shoot it down or anything. But no, no, definitely. Like that is sort of my my knee-jerk reaction no it's totally valid like there's nothing i can't prove this at all it's 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 just totally like a theory that i've i've had um also like you know doing a little bit of dmt here and there has definitely helped me uh see things that it could just be generated by like it's like a gan in your head right <laughs> totally it's just like you know sure right so and that that could be the case um but then people have like seen similar types of creatures like in these interdimensional beings which is like interesting have you ever done psychedelics or entheogens or no? No, yeah, no need to. You're good. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, right. So moving on. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving from, on from that. From the con common creatures that people see during trips. It's during trips, yeah. Um, what are some books that have had a big impact on you? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I would say. You know, th th this isn't necessarily like the most original answer. When I was very young, I quite liked Richard Dawkins' uh, The Selfish Gene, right? Yes. Um, partly because it was like my first proper introduction to the logic behind like evolution and things like that, but also realizing how much depth there is to 
natural selection happening not just in like the ways that you think. You know, I think one of the most mind-blowing components for me at that time was thinking about colonies of animals behaving basically like individuals because the mode of reproduction happens through a single, you know, the queen ant, and therefore the entire colony operates more analogously to like a single organism like we do. Or, you know, he was the one to introduce the notion of memes, right? And yeah. it's funny what the word meme has come to mean <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in light of like Dawkins' original use case, which was this profound idea of, hey, we've got another self-replicating entity in the world, which is ideas. And like, boy, is that a mind-blowing thought to think about ideas um, as analogous to genes in that way. And think, you know, what's the analogy of a cell wall? Um, and to some extent, certain like cult-like ideologies, right? a lot of the, the baggage that comes along with whatever the central belief there acts like a cell wall around the idea that keeps it from being attacked by other ideas around it and things where it's like, wow, that's an interesting framework for mind. So there's that. Um, on the math front, when I was very, I think I was in high school, one of my teachers gave me this book called The Art of Problem Solving, and mm. now there's a, an associated website and a whole bunch of things for it, um, written by a guy named Richard Rissick, who... I actually have been on a podcast with before, so if nice. people wanted to look at that, I think he's still yeah. doing his podcast. Uh, I think, so it was all around problem solving type math, um, especially competition math, but what matters less than the competitive aspect is the creative problems that they come up with. I think that had a huge influence on my relationship with patterns in math, because what you see in school is very different from the sort of things where you have this enforced self-rediscovery of something. So for any high schooler learning math, if not that book, something analogous where it's problem-driven rather than lesson-driven. Super awesome. Um, what about like fiction? Fiction? Or hmm. any, any time. No, 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 no. That's, a, that's a good question. Man, I feel like I haven't read enough fiction lately. Same. Uh, oh, I should have a much more solid answer to this, shouldn't I? No, I mean, there's. it's been a while. Like I think this is a silly one. I'm, I'm, you said influential, so when I think influential, I jump back to childhood, right? Yeah. So I can think of recent fiction bits, but it's like time will tell if they turned out to be influential. This is a silly answer. You remember The Life of Pi? Yeah. Yeah. I think, so I was someone who grew up, I didn't have religion, uh, just sort of uh, don't believe any gods. But I, I feel like that was the first time that I was not an asshole about like <laughs> religion and being sort of this snarky, like, ah, oh, people who are religious are like, they just don't understand the truth instead of realizing, oh, okay, S something about the like perspectives of that protagonist made me much more... I guess, sympathetic to the values that um, the religion does provide in a way that ultimately translated to like a much more hopefully mature relationship with it than the like childhood militant atheist. Right. <laughs> right. No, I was the same way. I mean, Dawkins definitely helped with that when I was like 16. It's like, religion sucks. <laughs> F everything. <laughs> you guys suck. No, for sure. Also, like Sam Harris is amazing, like in general. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's great. Not quite a fiction author, but... <laughs> right, no, just on the non-religious aspect, like the end of, I think it was called The End, the end of Faith. Of, the End of Faith, yeah. Yeah. This book. Yeah, those are some great ones. So um, you have done so much in so little time, relatively. What's next? What's next for you? For the foreseeable future, I still think the main focus should be videos. Uh, I see meaningful momentum with them, and like people seem to be deriving value from them. Uh, so I kind of don't want to shift away from that. There's a lot of just a lot of content that I want to make, and I see um, ways of doing lessons with an animated medium that just want to dive into more. Uh, ben Eater, who's another YouTuber, and I did this one experimental project with like explorable videos. Uh, so it's like one of the videos that I do, except you can play around with the things in the screen as you go. Um, I saw a video of that, but like it's not on YouTube, is it? Like, it can't be. It can't be. <laughs> right? And, and, unless we were to have some sort of in with the YouTube engineers. That would be wonderful. That'd so maybe I can try to like rub shoulders with the, the YouTube folk to make that happen. Um, so it can't be on YouTube. And as a result, it's much lower reach. I think it might be fun at some point in the future to experiment with something like that again. We did it with Quaternions, which I would prefer to do it with a top... Like it was sort of an accident that that happened to be the topic. So it would be fun to do it with one that is more broadly a thing that the average Joe wants to learn that still would benefit from visualization and interactivity. For sure. I feel like, yeah, we could, I mean, I could complain about YouTube all day over here, <laughs> but um, they didn't have their like YouTube education playlist, like glorified playlist thing where they added some things. Uh, Jabril did a thing mm -hmm. for them and Dan Schiffman did as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just not enough. Like seriously, YouTube, if you're listening, like, come on, like 
Give well, us... well, well, what do you want? You're right. You're no, right. no, no, no. I'm, no, I'm actually no, curious. Like, no, so I'd like some kind of like interactive, like, tool that allows me to, to plug in some animation, like a like a poll in real time would be great. Like a real time poll, like pause the video, answer the question, and then I can have like three different scenes based on. Yeah, it's uh, with a lot of things. I think, like, if you're YouTube, you have to consider the fact that creators kind of suck. And the more power that you give them, the more opportunity there is to abuse it in a way that ends up making the whole platform kind of trashy. Mm -hmm. So another unpopular opinion I hold is like, YouTube was right to get rid of annotations. Whereas certainly in the education community, this is a horrible thing because when you make a mistake in a video, you want to be able to have an annotation that like corrects it or have some fun interactive component on uh, what do you think will happen, A or B, and then based on what you click on, you go to a different video. Like there's clearly many good use cases the problem is, by and large, how most people were using it just trashed the website. It was just made it a trashier place to be, especially that quite often it would be like some promotion or advertisement, right? You create a video, it goes viral, you're looking for ways to like monetize its virality after the fact, and you just sort of fill it with annotations doing something. So I'm like, yeah, that was probably the right choice, even if at times I think, boy, would I love to be able to correct that typo. Same yeah. deal on granting more power within the platform. Let's say you're thinking about educators. Like maybe a lot of things would make sense for specific trusted use cases, but don't make sense more broadly. And at that point, you know, why not just do that on your own website, right? Yeah, it's just more work. But right, it's more whatever. work for them. Like you're why right. should we get their work for free? <laughs> like they do so much for us, right? They they do a lot for us, but. I just, I guess I have a sour taste in my mouth because like one time for that like YouTube playlist education thing, they like approached me and then like the, the girl was like, hi, I'm with YouTube. And it's like, we were wanted to do this education thing with you. I'm like, oh great, like this sounds great. And then in the middle of the call, it's like, okay, so what kind of channel do you have? It's like, you didn't even do your research. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you like, so that's, I, I, I guess I feel like, don't waste my time right now. Um, and then I applied and they said no. So <laughs> I'm a little salty, I guess. That's like the truth of it. Fair. But whatever, like, it's all good. I'm a regular YouTube apologist in various conversations within the community. As people are complaining about the algorithm, you know, I'm like, I don't know, I think it's better than the alternative. But <laughs> Well, it's working <laughs> I mean, for you, but right. No, well, no, I, like, I think, <laughs> I think by and large, it's working for almost everyone. The problem is that, um, like, the, the, the only alternative is to have a system where people are just watching what they're subscribed to. Something more analogous to how people consume podcasts, where it's not going to be recommended to them. And there's an appeal to that. You can certainly, you don't have to worry about, is this title very enticing? Then you could be more artistic as a result. I just think what would happen is fewer people would consume YouTube. And instead of having this conversation about like the algorithm that YouTube's created, we'd have this conversation about the algorithm of X video platform that actually won the online video game because they created the thing that's more enticing to viewers while YouTube just dwindled off into like so something else. So I think it's kind of inevitable. And given that it exists, I don't know. I think they generally do a pretty good job. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but more often than not, when someone, some creator is complaining about the algorithm screwing them over, I think, is it actually screwing you over? Or is it the case that a piece of content that you thought people would really like, it was the people who didn't like it, which is hard to like swallow, and then the algorithm recognized that they weren't having a good experience with it, so started recommending it less. I've had content where I felt like, man, I really like this. I think it's like fun and new, and maybe people will enjoy it. And they just didn't. And I'm like kind of disappointed that the video didn't do too well. But at some point, you have to sit back and say, well, you know, why didn't they like it? And I, I suspect that it's not a fluke in the algorithm. I suspect, no, they have every incentive in the world to make sure that what they recommend to people is a thing that people want to watch. So between the choices of the algorithm messed up in this use case versus turns out people didn't like it, should probably swallow my pride and recognize that it's the second one. Um, but it's so much more fun to just blame the deity, right. isn't right. it? <laughs> it is. When things don't go well, it's like, yeah. ah, screw you. Screw the man. Screw big brother. Screw big brother. Yeah. No, but it is hard to be self-critical. And I, I, I do agree with you. And I am invested in this platform as you are. And... I would be afraid if something, you know, went wrong with it or YouTube was gone because I've invested so much into it. So um, that is something that I'm afraid of. Speaking of fear, what <laughs> <laughs> spiders is the answer. Spiders is the answer. Like the thing that you're afraid of. Because uh, yeah. I was going to ask, what is something that you are afraid of? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a silly but true answer. Uh, I, I would say I'm like not always stoked with the choices Patreon seems to make. And that's another thing that I've I'm much more like my eggs are in the basket of Patreon is like what sustains the channel. Uh, I think they should just be like a small business that like has a very minimal product. Don't need to like try to do fancier things with it or something. But I think um, maybe it's by the pressures of having had a lot of venture capital pumped in such that they feel the need to be like a $10 billion company that they, I don't know, they, they just seem to invest their efforts in w ways that seem really weird when I'm like, your function, your, your like website is kind of a lousy website to actually deal with. Like maybe fix that first before you try imitating Snapchat or before you try like offering these different tiers for like new creators coming on where you'll take a larger percentage for offering like tooling that doesn't actually seem to add on top of what the core value is. So as long as they just like keep their act together decently, I think all is well, but I am a little bit afraid of them like mm, acting in ways that end up compromising the monopoly that they have, I guess. Just because like their monopoly is very convenient <laughs> for creators because you don't want to like stratify yourself among different platforms and have to bet on like what the next good platform will be because you end up investing a lot into it. Yeah. Uh, maybe that qualifies. Yeah, as no, that qualifies. Like, oh, economic collapse too. Yeah, no, I think that that feels, um, you know, within the realm of possibilities in the next like two years. Uh, in the in, United States? Well, I think anything that was in the United States would probably propagate more globally, right? Because there's so much foreign investment here. So, uh, you know, w when you work as a creative of some kind, you know, it's a l maybe a little bit more exposed to such things than um, than other sectors of the economy. So, yeah, we'll see. Why is that? I'm well, okay. So I think um, either either you're monetizing based on ads, you're monetizing based on directly selling the content somehow or based on like a side business in some way. Insofar as you're monetizing based on ads, just all companies, their ad spend is gonna go down because they're less inclined to like invest in long-term branding future just because their organization is somehow on fire and they need to make cutbacks. So I think that goes pretty quickly. Um, something where you're selling the content, if that's sort of a pay what you choose model with a Patreon type thing, or if it's subscription services in some way, that's probably gonna be one of the first things that people cut from their budget, right, is spending discretionary income on content consumption, especially if it's like a pay what you choose situation. And then insofar as you have a side business, totally depends on what that side business is. But you know, for a lot of creators, it's something that it doesn't fall into the category of ne like life necessities for people, right? Yeah. Your side business isn't <laughs> like a grocery store or something. Um, instead, it's maybe mildly frivolous or just a little bit more optional for like if someone needs to buy it or not. Um, whereas you know, if you are offering like staples, uh, just things that like people actually need that are a little bit more robust to a, a, a shrinking of disposable income among the population around you, maybe a different story. I think that's a very um, smart, valid fear to have of economic collapse. I, I think I'm kind of on that train as well, but I'm still optimistic. I'm long-term optimistic, long -term but like these things, there's cycles to how debt works, right? Yeah. There's definitely cycles there. So, um, so last question that I want to ask you. Let's go. Was, um, and I kind of know, I kind of have a direction I want the answer to go based on what you're saying. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which is, um, I want to ask you, what is a controversial opinion you have uh, that not many people have? And you were, and I remember, so when the pod podcast started, uh, you like moved the Mac, the touch bar down on my Mac. Sure. And your opinion was... I feel like I have a lot of unpopular opinions. Th yeah, this is great. I think everything about the new Mac inputs, wonderful. I love the keyboard. I love the touch bar. What? I love USB-C for everything. Um, so let's start with the keyboard, right? Okay. Evidently, people have had problems with like keys getting stuck and stuff like that. I think if you just push really hard on it when it gets stuck, maybe I just have a good batch or something like that. It's so satisfying to type on in comparison to anything else. Whatever they did for the specific like amount of pressure and the feel of that, it's like beautiful. The touch bar... The idea of having your input mechanism be responsive to the app that you're part of, especially in a way that allows for continuity, like continuous interaction. You know, there's uh, some use cases where it just feels a little bit silly, but some, like when I'm previewing animations or things like that, and being able to, with my hands, 
uh, not necessarily moving to the mouse and finding the thing to properly click, but being able to like very naturally scroll um, when the flow has just been like on a keyboard. I love that. Or like scrolling through like the song that you're listening to or something like that. Um, and the idea that the, the input mechanism where your hands already are being responsive to the app, obviously that seems great. It's the same reason that people love iPads. Uh, I don't really understand what people have against the touch bar, to be honest. Other, like everything that I hear, it sounds like, yeah, it's weird and unfamiliar, but everything is unfamiliar at first. <laughs> you know, give it a little bit of time. Well, it's just annoying because it's just unpredictable in what it's going to display. I guess you, you've learned to predict. So it was a screen. <laughs> so it was an iPad. <laughs> well, I mean, no, because you, you kind of have gotten used to like what the browser like buttons are, like in Chrome, for example, whereas I don't know why I hate it so much, honestly, <laughs> now that I'm like pressed on it. Uh, I bet two years from now you'll hate it less. Maybe you'll even like it. Fair. Uh, How did you feel about AirPods? I love AirPods. Okay. I'm a huge fan. You, and I, and from, from the beginning, you were like, this is a totally normal one. thing to have in my... Okay. Yeah. Okay. How about you? Um, oh, well, I, I use Bose, uh, but the, the, the idea of like wireless headphones, even if they look weird and nerdy at first, all behind that. The QC35 twos? That sounds correct. Yeah. yeah nice. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I love those. But a lot of people, they were just like, they look weird, right? right. And it just, like, it looks bizarre to have like these things dangling out of your ears. But after about a year, everyone seemed pretty into it. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if that's the most compelling, controversial opinion. No, you've got to have I at think. least one more. You said you have several. I'm, I'm actually curious if, if you can think of another. I mean, I've already talked about being a YouTube apologist among creative circles. That is circles. a big one. That is a big one. Is that yeah. sort of, the, the, the problem with controversial opinions uh, is that when they're sufficiently controversial, you don't want to talk about them. Right. Uh, that so, is true. so what's the playful controversial what's opinion? What's playful one? <laughs> Maybe something about math. Or, uh, um. I feel like I must be able to give a good answer here. Like, uh, what's uh, do you have an answer here? Like the opinion yeah. that, um, like for me, like a yeah, 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 yeah. What's something that not a lot of people believe, but you? I think that it is the more people that that's a good question. I didn't even think about, and I was gonna say, like, I don't think spreading AI knowledge spreading data literacy in terms of the popular frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch created by these corporations is as good a thing as I thought when mm. I first started this channel. Because in a way, you are helping them in their overall objective, which honestly has resulted in a lot of industrial, global scale manipulation of human minds. So by using TensorFlow, I can't believe I'm saying this, um, or using PyTorch, in a way, you're helping them mine data, or you're by using their computing, you're, you're giving them money, which they're using to make these algorithms better for optimizing for attention instead of well-being, as Tristan Harris said. So I would opt for other frameworks that are more open source. The problem is that th these frameworks are so good. <laughs> well, uh, how do you feel about using YouTube? Ideally, there would be some kind of peer-to-peer -peer alternative how do you feel about using Google search? It's one of those things where it's like, I just got to use it. Because Google of, Maps? Yes, I use it all. Mail? <laughs> what was it? Gmail? Gmail, yeah, I use Calendar. it all. I mean, I wrote, okay, so I wrote a book called Decentralized Applications. Mm -hmm. I was way too early. It's still not there yet. Because I thought that we would see this world by now. I wrote it like three years ago. I thought by now blockchains and all this stuff would have scaled. We would have sorted out, sort out all those issues with like distributed hash tables and IPFS and all these things. But clearly... We're not there yet. So I have hope that we'll like eventually not need to use these centralized sources and we can move from a world where we're not expecting Google to not be evil. We move to can't be evil. I feel like there was a billboard to that effect. on my. You saw that up. billboard? <laughs> yeah, I saw that billboard too. Blockstream. <laughs> Shout out to Blockstream. <laughs> Took it from you guys. That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, I Maybe my controversial opinion is... I, I don't know if I, I would stand behind this as hard, but just like, I, d I don't necessarily think centralization to corporations like Google and Amazon is actually a bad thing. Um, but that I would want to put more thought into before staking my 
putting that as like, right. oh, this is a core value that I hold. That's right, more right. just like a casual thing to put out. On the math education front, um, I don't know if this is actually an unpopular opinion, but one thing I would say is I don't think we should tell students, let's say in like middle school or high school, that the things we're teaching them are useful. I don't think we should sell it to them as you will need to use this, right? Because instead, I think we should be honest with them about the fact that it's actually, they're almost certainly not going to use it, right? You're learning about the quadratic formula. You're not going to use that in your life. Maybe you go into computer science and you go into graphics and you're doing some like ray tracing and at some point you're like, oh, I'm using the quadratic formula here. More likely than not, you're not going to use it. Elementary schoolers learning to multiply, you know, two-digit numbers, you're not going to use that. Like calculators will do it. Um, when you're learning about conic sections, right, and the various properties of a hyperbola, when's the last time you found yourself using the property of a hyperbola? And you're a pretty like technical-minded person, right? Uh, so yeah. I think we should... Uh, Stop implicitly lying to students by saying that like these things are important, right? And then try to remove as many examples from textbooks that are like the sort of word problems that say, oh, like everyday applications of such and such, and <laughs> the application that comes to mind, right? It's like, you know, Johnny is on a beach and he has two different beacons that can tell the distance from another beacon on a boat that he knows to be 25 miles from the shore, but he doesn't know where it is laterally. Like use the information of these two beacons. Um, like the students are smart, they know oh, I'm sorry, if this is the way you think I'm using it, yeah, no, I'm not going to need to do that, and they're going to disengage from it. And instead, it should be sold to them much more the same way that we sell, like, exercise. You know, when you're lifting uh, a particularly shaped piece of iron with a particular motion that isolates a particular muscle, no, you're never going to need to make that particular motion with that particular weight later in life, but everyone kind of understands the idea of muscle building for things that happen later on. Or sell it to them for the pure delight of problem solving, right? Like sell it the way that the mathematicians are really originally discovering this stuff um, thought about it, which is with a certain irreverence towards ultimate applicability. It's one of the great virtues of math that the things that are beautiful happen to be useful. And so as you see enough of those examples, it makes the beauty itself more appealing. So when possible, you bring in the applications, but I think we're often way too eager to try to make it feel relevant in a way that's counterproductive. Wow. Some variant of that, I think I could distill into a sentence that we could get most math teachers to disagree with at first, but maybe it's, it's hard to know if that's actually a controversial opinion. I think it is. And I think that is, that just needed to be said. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. That's, that, that's a deep one for sure. And it makes me think as well, but yeah, so that's, that's it for the, the <laughs> podcast. Um, guys, remember to subscribe to Grant's YouTube channel, uh, follow him on Twitter and, uh, definitely check out his videos. You won't regret it. Grant, thank you so much for this. Thanks for having me. It was really kind.